So the learning objectives are to understand the different phenotypes of, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that can be managed surgically, review the relationship between end diastolic volume and, and diastolic function, and to compare the outcomes of this, what we consider a more conventional treatment for non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with uh, heart transplant, which is really the only other surgical. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is, is a, a common group of patients that we see for surgery through April of 2019. We had done over 3,600 operations of one sort or another. If you include all the patients done during the pandemic year, we've now operated on more than 4,000 patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We'll talk about a transapical incision, but remember, our, I want to clarify that a transapical incision can be used for midventricular obstruction or to get residual subaortic obstruction or for this ventricular enlargement procedure that I'll show you. Now, what about the phenotypes? When people think of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they often will think about just subaortic obstruction. And this, this patient has this little knuckle of subaortic septum and is an ideal candidate for a transaortic septal myectomy. This patient also has systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve and left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, but size of the septum here and the extent of hypertrophy down to the mid and distal septum. These patients both have LVOT obstruction, but they need different operations. And the reason why that's important is important to recognize the length of subaortic obstruction is if you don't relieve that, you'll have patients that will come back with midventricular obstruction. So this is a patient referred for reoperation. Notice that the surgeon during the first procedure got rid of the subaortic obstruction. There's no SAM, but now there is severe midventricular obstruction remains symptomatic. So the way we would approach this patient would be with a transapical midventricular myectomy. Now septal thickness is important um, in the past uh, some surgeons had advised mitral valve replacement if the septal thickness was less than 18 millimeters. But if you understand where the obstruction is, it's not related to the thickness of the septum, it's related to the extent of the obstruction. You can do myectomies even in <coughs> septa that are much thinner. This patient was 12 millimeters with SAM and eight millimeters without. There's also a group of patients with isolated midventricular obstruction. Uh, you can see the arrows point to the flow acceleration in the midventricle. The bottom arrow shows you that this LVOT area is uh, free of obstruction. And then you can have odd situations like apical aneurysms. This is an extreme case of a patient with recurrent ventricular tachycardia and midventricular. So all of these patients are candidates for relief of obstruction. The other group of patients that Rick mentioned are patients <clears throat> with diastolic heart failure related to initially uh, apical myectomy. Now, I say initially, I'll tell you about other patients that we've operated on. But apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, at least the patients we see for surgery, we think have encroachment on ventricular end diastolic volume that contributes to their heart failure. And you can see this is well shown on the left side, on the right side of ventricular gram, and you can see that it looks like the ventricles, the distal ventricle is cut off. Now, apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is more common in Asia than it is in the US. It accounts for about a quarter of the cases in Asia, about 10% of patients uh, in our HCM clinic. And, the prob and, and most patients are asymptomatic. If they just have some apical hypertrophy and no symptoms, there's nothing to be done. But once symptoms develop, they're very difficult to manage because <clears throat> their stroke volume is limited. There's nothing really that relaxes the muscle itself. And sometimes the only way they keep their cardiac output up is by heart rate. And so if you beta block them too much, they sometimes get worse. And of course, atrial fibrillation is common. I'm not sure how many years ago it was that we were talking about this particular group of patients, and I remember with Rick we discussed the possibility of enlarging the ventricle. Pretty simple concept, if the ventricle's too small and you have heart failure, if you enlarge it, will you improve their, their symptoms? And so we thought about doing apical myectomies or going through the apex to do a, a, an extensive septal myectomy to enlarge the ventricle. 
Now, the, the, the theory is on these two slides, and it's oversimplified a bit, but this is the end diastolic pressure volume relationship. And so at end diast the end diastolic pressure volume relationship is exponential. And you can see here, this is a normal patient, and this is a patient with a stiffer ventricle so that for any end diastolic, pre any end diastolic volume, the pressure is higher. And these patients have the same in diastolic volume, but they have, this one has a stiffer ventricle, and this is the formula. So what we've done here is we've changed the alpha constant, a stiffer heart, stiffer heart muscle. This patient has a higher pressure for any in diastolic, but the slope of this curve is exactly the same. We've just shifted it leftward, and shifting it leftward means you have a smaller volume. This can be corrected by enlarging the volume of the ventricle. The other one is a heart muscle problem. Now, <clears throat> for, the, for surgeons, the, the main thing to uh, be aware of is that there's a, there often is apical displacement of the papillary muscles in patients with apical HCM. So you have to be careful not to damage those. The operation's done this way. This is a <clears throat> the, the apex of the heart has been elevated into the wound so that you can see it. We've made the initial incision in the apex, and you ought to be looking in the left ventricle, but you can see after the ventriculotomy, really, we're not even down through the muscle at the ventricle. Here you can see just the beginning of the, <clears throat> of the cavity, and then we start taking muscle here and here. Now, this, the papillary muscles are here and over here during the operation by the assistant. And we start enlarging the muscle or enlarging the cavity by removing the muscle. And then we close after we've completed the apical myectomy to enlarge the ventricle, then we close it with felt strips, uh, as you see there. I'm going to let this play um, while we talk about it and, and tell you a little bit about how the operations evolved. I'll show you some of the results, but Patients are improved, or many of the patients are improved, and the problem of the small ventricle is not limited just to patients with apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There are other patients who have crowding of the ventricle with or without subaortic obstruction that benefit from some degree of left ventricular enlargement. And so we, we end up doing this in patients with <clears throat> some degree of Diastol or what we think is some degree of diastolic dysfunction in addition to, to subaortic obstruction. Now notice that most of the muscle that we're removing is from the septum, and you can see some of the whitish scar, and that presumably is the same thing that shows up on, with late gadolinium enhancement. This is a, a cardiotomy sucker, and, and the, the assistant is holding the cardiotomy sucker so that it pushes the posterior medial papillary muscle out of the way and protects it from me. There, we're taking out more muscle. And then work further towards <clears throat> the aortic valve. We use this approach in some patients where we have residual subaortic obstruction. You can actually reach quite far up towards the aortic valve. I won't uh, torture you with the whole thing, but that's, that's the basic technique. Now, uh, people often ask the, the question about the apex of the heart where we have that big suture line and question whether you <clears throat> reduce systolic function by that large suture line. Remember that patients with apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the apex is not contributing at all to ventricular ejection. It's, it's full of muscle. But you can see here, this is a patient before operation, this is a patient after operation. I think you can see that there is contraction at the apex and it's just the very tip of the heart that doesn't move much. So even though we make quite a large incision, that really doesn't impair systolic function to a great degree. When we first started doing the procedure, uh, uh, Dr. Nishimura did uh, some detailed hemodynamic studies. This just shows a tracing of a patient before and after, 
Same uh, ventricular pressure, lower left atrial pressure, that all looks good. Uh, and the composite uh, uh, data are shown here. In general, there was a reduction in the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. There was augmentation of left ventricular end diastolic volume. And we don't, we're not routinely looking at pressure volume curves, but here's a pressure volume curve on a patient, uh, a preoperative pressure volume curve. And if the operation works, we should be increasing the stroke volume and decreasing the end diastolic pressure. And here is the same patient with a pressure volume curve after operation. So the procedure has some physiologic basis. Now, here's a typical case. Um, this is a 22-year-old man who had uh, apical midventricular obstruction. He was really had class four heart failure, uh, was referred for cardiac transplantation, looked online and found that there was another option. Uh, his symptoms were unresponsive to all the usual medical treatment as many of the patients are, and you can see his ICD there. And here <coughs> is the patient preoperatively. You can see that the apex of the heart here is obliterated. You can see it in the four chamber here and in the short axis. And we did the apical myectomy. And now this is the echo afterwards. You can see a pumping chamber out here. A little bit more at the, uh, on the short axis and here. You can see the contraction of the septum in the anterior wall. Uh, after surgery, his measured stroke volume was 72, which was near normal for him. Now, we've done over, uh, over 200 of these operations to enlarge the ventricle. The overall operative risk is low. Overall was 3%, but we've not had any deaths in the last oh, almost a decade. And this is a survival. Uh, these are patients that have had apical myectomy to enlarge the left ventricular cavity. They're not subaortic obstruction. And this is their survival out to 15 years. And the question is, is that good or bad? Well, it's not quite as good as patients that have subaortic obstruction. And really the only, the only group of patients that are comparable are patients with apical HC or HCM who undergo, undergo transplantation. So we got, <clears throat> some data from the UNOS database, um, survival of patients who were on the wait list who had the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we compared those to patients who had this procedure. And you can see that at least in the unadjusted survival, the patients that had the apical myectomy did just as well or slightly better. Actually, we, we did some adjustment. It turns out that the patients that we operated on were a little sicker than the other patients. So after you do adjustment for the usual risk factors, the difference is even greater. So these are patients on the wait list. Remember when you refer, a I mean, everyone knows, but when you refer a patient for transplant, they, all, they don't always get a transplant. And then we compared the, the outcome of the patients that had transapical myectomy to enlarge the ventricle to patients who actually got a transplant. And this is the adjusted survival. The patients up here had the conventional operation. These are patients who received a cardiac transplant and so the survival of these patients is at least as good as patients who have a transplant. It's not perfect. Not every patient is class one afterwards, and a few patients have gone on to transplant, but certainly for many patients, it eliminates the need for that, and it helps them uh, quite a bit. Now, this, the, the last group of patients I'll just tell you about, because we've not, uh, we've not developed this quite as much as with the apical cases, but as we, as we gain more experience with enlargement of the ventricle to try to improve diastolic heart failure, we recognize that there's a group of patients that have what we call systolic cavity obliteration, and I expect everybody's seen them. Now, this patient doesn't have apical HCM in the usual sense. You have a cavity that goes all the way out to the apex. But during systole, the cavity completely obliterates, and during diastole, it doesn't seem to be very big. The cavity seems crowded. These are interesting patients because some of them can describe, they almost describe the physiology. I had a, a patient, was actually was an ENT surgeon from Florida, who by the way did not have surgery, but he came for a consultation. 
And he said he used to exercise all the time, and nowadays, every time he exercised, his heart rate went to 130 as soon as he started to exercise. And the problem is the only way these people can keep their cardiac output up is to increase their heart rate, and that's why beta blockers aren't always the best thing for them. So the, the physiology in many ways is the same in these patients with systolic cavity obliteration if their end diastolic volume is small. And we've done the same ventricular enlargement procedure in about 30 of these patients. So to, to summarize then, I'll point out that the apical phenotype is not always benign. Uh, think about apical myectomy as an option for patients for selected patients with diastolic heart failure and reduced LV cavity size. Now, the common question is, what is reduced cavity size? And we've tried as hard as we can to come up with guidelines, but, but the, the measurement of LV and diastolic volume in some of these ventricles is so difficult that we, we, get, we, we really don't know that there are any numbers that you can hang your hat on. But if the patients have symptoms of diastolic heart failure in what visually seems to be a small ventricle, whether it's apical uh, distribution or uh, this uh, systolic cavity obliteration, you should consider it. These are the numbers that we published just because people required us to give a number, and these are small ventricles and small stroke volumes. But the operation does improve diastolic function, as, as I showed you on those earlier slides, and symptoms are improved uh, once you enlarge the left ventricular cavity. And finally, the survival appears to be superior to that of patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and then are listed for heart transplant. Thank you.